Right. Okay. Um. Well, yeah. Let's, let me go ahead and start. Um. Yeah. So I did put up a new version of assignment two. So make certain you see that. Um, you need to do a get pull um, or however you normally download things. So for example, if you have your, if you're using the virtual environment that we set up, you can do it from a terminal um, on your, um, inside your virtual environment it should work, I think. So, you know, the get pull command. Uh, if it doesn't work, you might need to do it on your host system instead. So how, wherever you run and get clone before, you need to uh, do a get pull if you're doing stuff from the command line. Um, that just synchronizes. So any, anything that I put up, uh, you'll be able to see it now. Um, um, you can down those, but download those by hand, but I don't recommend it. I do recommend getting used to Git. So you make sure you have everything. The, the um, so I just said, uh, there's basically a change, um, same name, but a change in the assignment two um, notebook that was in there. Um, you should, when you do a Git pull, you should find there's a new data file called assignment two weather.csv, which you're using for this assignment. Um, and there are a couple of figures, which I'll talk about uh, uh, today maybe a bit um, that uh, are used in the notebook for the assignment that'll be big helps. Um, so I think those are the only new stuff or change stuff that got pushed down in there. So if um, if you um, if you open up the file, I mean, you know, should see that it's uh, a new date it's this year. Um, it's one way you check you have the correct one. I mean, the other one though is that the assignment is about this particular data set. So, um, it's the one about temperature and pressure and rain and stuff like that. All right. I'll come back to that, talk more about that. But if you still got, um, I still got uh, the remaining day here, and then another week. Uh, I mean, uh, about a week and a half um, for you to look at this. I would encourage you though to go ahead and get it if you haven't yet, um, and start working on it. Um, um, so that next week we can, if you have questions or having some issues, particular things, you can bring them up. Um. So I wanted to finish up the, my, my first half of the class today. Let's uh, continue with the classification problem. So we mostly covered a lot of stuff except for extending the idea to when we have more than a binary, more than two classes that we want to build a model of, so the multi-class classification. Um, so I have these open here. Uh, Um, so let me, let me pick it back up from here. We, we covered some of this on Tuesday. Um, so I, I, I forgot, I failed to mention last time, uh, one, one of the obvious things when you're doing classification is to compute accuracy. So for binary classification, I either got it right or didn't. Or for any kind of classification app, I either got the correct class or it was wrong. So you can't really use accuracy for a regression run. That's another thing that's going to be different. I mean, so what does it mean to have the right house price? Do I have to get exactly the dollars and cents to say it's right? And if it's off by a cent, it's wrong. You know? Think you could define a criteria and turn it into something that you count accuracy on, like if it's right within plus or minus point five hundred dollars. But when you're doing that, you're beginning, you're categorizing the original problem anyway. So now accuracy is really how good I can 
predicted so the price range from this to this pushes back that button and changes it into a discrete number of buckets. And you can all you can always categorize, yeah, you know, always change the regression problem into a problem with categories by doing that, like right? you know, picking some ranges. Um, so uh, anyway, I mean that means though for a true uh, classification problem. Uh, your first question, you know, your first thing can be if you want to judge how well it's doing is how accurate was I? Did I get 50% right, 75% right in my prediction? So, and so um, uh, actually, it's pretty easy to calculate. We could have calculated, uh, we could have shown a calculation by hand if we didn't do that. So, if we have a classifier, uh, that's trained. We can ask it for predictions for a set of data. Um, if we have the labels for that data, the accuracy is just we have to count up how many what percentage it got right. Uh, these predictions. Um, but um, what what I was leading up to on that is uh, accuracy can be misleading. It can be hard to interpret. Uh, you might hear me say that a lot in machine learning. So, uh, you know, we give measures like this and, and um, a new practitioner, beginning practitioners will want like a clear answer, you know, what, you know, what is a good accuracy you know, or, or uh, what is a good mean um, um, square error in a regression. And there's, there's, uh, Rarely going to be uh, easy answers like that. It's always going to be it depends, right? So ninety five percent accuracy um, uh, might be good or not um, on this uh, data set here. So uh, oh, we we did get into that topic a little bit because um, the argument is this may not be as good as you think because we're, we're building a uh, not five detector or, or five detector. Um, what we were doing last time in order to turn it into a binary classification problem for this um, uh, MNIST data set here. But that data set has been of an imbalance. So 90% of the items are not fives and only 10% of the items you can train with are fives approximately. So that means that just always predicting it's not a five gives you 9% accuracy. Okay, so you really have to compare performance to some idea of what is the absolute minimum you expect. And that can be hard to figure out what, what's the worst performance. To, to create a good baseline is a is a good step uh, if you're trying to build a model of something. Um, one common baseline is how does, if I just randomly select um, an answer, you, you, you'll get a, you get a similar score if you just use random selection instead of always saying false um, in this case, because 90% of the items are uh, not fives, so um, uh, even though I'm only get, going to get about fifty of those, fifty percent of those right, um, um, I'm, I'm, I might have to take that back. And now I think about it more, you might get a difference. I have to run that about that. Um, so yeah, if you just do a random guessing with this unbalanced one, uh, you might not get the same um, uh, baseline and performance as you would get with always saying true. It would look probably more like 50 50. Um, anyway, um, so that raised the question of, of you know, what should we use if we want to compare or if we want to, uh, you know, so, so actually might not always be a, a good measure. Um, so, uh, what to use is probably is a lot more complicated for classification problems than for regression problems. So, the root mean squared error is pretty straightforward. Uh, measure that there's other things that, that you can use for regression, but RMSE is by far the most common measure of how good or bad my model is doing uh, this prediction uh, for a uh, real value regression number. So it's not so straightforward for classification problems. Um, so I always, always recommend that a good step to start with is the confusion matrix. Uh, we also brought this up last time at the end uh, on Tuesday. Um, I mean, if, if you know, uh, you know how balanced or unbalanced your data set is, if you combine that with looking at how it does on 
the correct predictions and the true positives and false negatives. Uh, that'll give you a better idea of how it's doing than raw accuracy. And, and, and if these are unbalanced or something, uh, it will tell you something about um, how the model is doing what it does to its performance. So, um, To get into, you know, like competitions or things or, well, uh, or, or the literature, people doing classification problems will often use uh, measures like precision recall. Um, let, me, um, let me try and run this. Can't remember if there's a long population in this or not. Um, so for any particular classifier, um, we can define, uh, additional measures. These are ways of trying to summarize what you could maybe see by looking at the raw confusion metrics. The, so the, the most common are probably precision recall, uh, Um, all right, I wanted to have it run down to this point here. Try it again. Um, so these two, I don't know, I always, um, it'd be hard to describe them. But it's easy to calculate these. Uh, and, and again, um, if we're asked to do this um, on the assignment, uh, you could calculate it by hand. Um, so precision is the, the, I think the name's clear. So that's how precise your uh, um, your uh, classifier is doing in its uh, recall of things. Um, or in, in, in its performance. Right? So So for precision, you know, if you know the true positives uh, and the false positives, it's really just the ratio of the true positives to everything that it did. Um, so, um, so, you know, like this figure from the textbook shows, you know, you calculate that as like um, three out of four. So it's really the ratio of the six to the, um, Total number of instances that we have uh, in the data set here. Um, so there, a, um, there is a, a method to calculate that from Scikit Learn, which is doing the same thing. So. Um, you should get the same score if you calculate yourself or use scikit learn. Nothing. So uh, in this data set here, the, the one here where the confusion matrix looks like that, uh, throw the ratio of this to like everything, right? So I guess uh, we're getting 67, 350. My confusion matrix go um, right. So actually, those the, the ratio of those to the combination of those two things. So likewise, recall is pretty easy to calculate uh, the ratio of the true positives to the sum. Of the other so you know like doing this by hand two positive plus the false negative so we're looking at the other uh place where we've made errors um in the confusion matrix so these two values here it's always in re relationship to the true positives that we had both the precision and recall um, 
score. Um, so, um, and there's another that you might run across the F1 score. Uh, you know, was an attempt to try and combine, and so so um, so both for both precision and recall, the higher the number, the better. This ratio um, is is uh, when it's one, um, it means that you're uh, not really having any errors, right? Since true positives are the top item uh, here, um, so if there's no errors, we, we approach one. Uh, if everything's an error, uh, you end up with low or zero true positives. Get a zero. So, so um, wanted to have this figure that showed the uh, putting these on the same plot here. Um, so the, the, there ends up being a trade-off between precision and recall, and you can actually um, adjust your model based on that if you need to emphasize one or the other. Um, so if you were to plot off precision recall, but if you change the threshold, so the default for like a binary classifier is to run the things to a number, uh, through through um, a, uh, um, a process to get a uh, single number, which is the thickness of it. Um, and and um, anything that's less than zero, we'll say is the negative class. Anything that's greater than that zero is the positive class. But you can change that threshold um, and you'll see it'll have an effect like this on precision and recall. So as you go one way or the other, if you don't change the model, you just change that threshold where you make your decision. Uh, make it bigger or smaller. Um, you can get the mob to be more precise, uh, but to do worse uh, on recall or vice versa by moving that around. Right? So in this case, we're not really building a new model. We're just uh, changing how it does. So the the, the trade-off, the reason why these are important, a lot of people that have to do things with binary classification uh, use precision and recall a lot to uh, get a feel for how the model is doing. Um, so the, the reason why that's important is um, um, for some problems, it's worse to have a false positive than it is to have a, tr um, a false negative. So uh, if uh, the classifier is cancer versus no cancer, the false, um, let me bring that figure up again. The um, false positives are going to be the case where um, um, it's actually not cancer, um, and you predicted that they had cancer. Right. So um, in that case, probably somebody would have to do more testing. Uh, that would worry them a lot, right? So we would need more. Um, um, but but they'd be okay. But in some ways, uh, you know, in that case, for life or death things, the false negatives can be more of a problem. So they might be more important to the system. So uh, in that case, we actually miss the case of cancer. So here, you know, maybe time, expense, and worry. But here, uh, for false positive uh, identification, uh, for false negative, where we incorrectly say we don't have the cancer, but we do, we're risking uh, you know, life or health. So in that case, you might want to change your slider a bit uh, to make certain that uh, you minimize, make the false negatives less likely in the system uh, at the expense of some false positives, right? um, more, more false positives. So without changing the model, um, you know, the only question you have is, right, what's the relative benefit or harm of false positives versus false negatives? Uh, but, um, you know, 
of course, the ideal answer is, well, build a better model. You, can, uh, you can't uh, change the threshold and increase both of these at the same time, but you can build a better model so that both precision and recall are higher for longer um, time by getting a better, a better predictor. Um, oh, uh, actually, if you ever look in um, the literature, you probably more likely see uh, a graph of this if they're talking about precision and recall. So graph them simultaneously on uh, the two axes of the plot. So this, again, this allows you to figure out a range where, uh, you know, where you start seeing precision getting worse at a much faster rate um, you know, going towards that direction. Um, okay, and, and besides precision recall, and uh, just to, to go back and finish up on this, um, so some. And that's two numbers instead of one. So F1 you might run across as well um, uh, is a, a, an attempt to summarize both of those as a single number. Um, so we're really using um, um, precision and recall, uh, but we're combining them in a particular way. So again, you know, the higher the F1 score, the better it's doing both simultaneously on precision and recall. The lower it is, the worse it's doing. Um, so another one that you might see is these ROC curves, receiver operating characteristic curves. Um, Um, it's it's doing I, I don't know, if, you know it's doing a similar thing to plotting recall precision, but it's using two different measures. But but this is a standard uh, one you'll see. So you know um, if you kind of figure out what's happened here, um, you can figure out here. But because of the two different uh, measures, uh, which was what sensitivity and um, um, uh, which is really the same thing. Um, As before, you know. So, uh, real quickly on this, if you ever do see a receiver operating curve ROC, um, the idea is that if I need to compare, you can use this to compare two different models um, over the, the full true positive or uh, false positives and false negatives, all the errors that they have. But, you know, the, the, the more area that's under the curve, the better it's doing. Right? So, so you'll often see this uh, to report results of, of different models trying to do a binary classification. Um, and usually the one that has more area under that uh, is, is performing better than any of them that you know, have less. And because of the way this calculation works, um, um, as a model gets down to having random performance, it'll get closer and closer to the uh, uh, the line of slope one um, figure. Um, so yeah, there were examples of plotting on the rest of those. So I, I think I, that was mostly it for when we you know talk about the basic ideas of classification. Uh, so let's look at. Um, the last bit here from chapter three. Um, so you could usually, if you have to, break a problem down, make it binary classification. So, I mean, we already gave an example of that. So, to do binary classification, uh, our task would be really um, more naturally non binary if we wanted to build a classifier for every digit. But um, we can 
certainly build a classifier that, that tries to predict whether it's five or not. Turn into a binary. In that case, all the labels can be yes or no or true or false. Right? Um, but you know, so often we'll have uh, the case where uh, we naturally have more than one class. We'd like to build one classifier that predicts, you know, which of the items of the multiple ones that we have. Uh, so that's all multi-class means here. Uh, this is more than binary. Um, so anytime we want to build a predictor where we have more than two classes, uh, we're talking about a multi-class classifier. Um, for some of the machine learning algorithms that can do classification, uh, there's a natural way to build it to have you know 10 outputs. So for MNIST, or we've got 10 classes, or so we want to have something that predict or predicts one, but you know, the, the 10 separate values from range or so. You know, uh, one common thing when you get down to it is we built we might do something like the one hot encoding that we talked about. So if I have multiple classes, uh you know, our first idea here um is um, we build um, a predictor for each uh, individual class. So one versus not one, two versus not two, three versus not three, and so on. And then, then we would have uh, 10 predictions and we have to use something to combine those. Right? So uh, that's what the um, um, this first section here is beginning to talk about. Uh, so uh, that's the one versus all strategy. Uh, another possibility to do that is to build classifiers and sort of make it two classes at a time. So again, it would be binary, but you do every possible pair. So the best. Describe in the textbook work here. So what's that? That's the one-on-one. Uh, -on -one, um, so um, yeah. So you can you can do either approach if your classifier doesn't support uh, a multi-class output kind of directly. You can do a multi-class classification by doing one or the other of this. So. Uh, one versus all, the, uh, one versus one. Um, so this one, you need more, right? So the, the number of uh, pairs, uh, the number of, of individual class pairs you'd have to build um, to combine uh, goes up uh, basically about close to the square, like it's talked about here. So that means if I have 10 classes, I actually have to build 100 different models uh, to do the head-to-head -head and then combine all those hundred results uh, to get my answer which one I pick. Um, so that would usually be more expensive, but um, this might have a better performance. Um, So, uh, so I should have mentioned uh, the step back here. Um, oh yeah, this is still, it didn't fix this here either. So um, if you're using this notebook, um, you should be able to use the new, uh, uh, yeah, there's a cell there with the, using the built-in, but it affects the minus two. It's usually better instead of downloading the file from somewhere. Um, Anyway, so all we're doing in the part four of the chapter is build the full classifier for the MNIST data. So some, um, uh, most of the classifiers, I think, will uh, allow you to pass in a multi-class task. Uh, behind the scenes, it will do one of those methods for you, uh, like we just talked about up here, in order to, if, if the method doesn't, uh, easily support multi-class output directly. Right? 
So, um, but for most of the time that's hidden from you. All you have to do, if you want to use like word, um, it's just passing in a data set where the, 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 the Y train in this case, the labels um, are instead of being a binary zero one, they are a multi-class of multiple uh, values in there, one, two. Um, and yeah, right, if you do that, it'll work fine. We ask for predictions instead of being prediction for all zero one, you'll get uh, an actual prediction of the category. So in this case, it's been predicted a, a three for the uh, first digit that we had. Um, I didn't display them again, so um, so we're not certain if that's right or not, depending on what we did to break this up into a train set, and a testing set. Um, So, um, yeah, I can't remember exactly, but uh, in this case, I, uh, you know, we're, uh, actually getting the um, uh, a single score for each one of the classes. So, uh, I can't remember if this implies that, uh, you know, we, it was uh, uh, one versus all here, um, because, right, we'd have to have 100 separate things of one versus one. We were checking every pair against every other. But this is a little bit easier to interpret. So uh, we think of this as a, a number uh, that the, the bigger it is, the more confident the model felt it was that class, right? So, um, um, so when you have something like that, if you ask for the extra predictions, it'll just find the one with the largest, predict that class, right? And so that what we were doing to combine things is the output, um, the output from our one versus the others wasn't um, um, same um, value, but it was, it was actually an estimate of you know, how uh, confident we are that the binary answer was correct. Uh, and I'm hesitating a little bit, uh, we will look at the mechanism of the logistic function that's coming up here. So we haven't really gotten details of classification or regression yet. So next week we're going to start looking at linear regression, actually how we do the calculations. And then after that, we'll look at the logistic function, um, uh, which would be what was happening where these are calculated. Um, so, So, you know, to summarize on that, the um, for most of the functions, if you want to do classification, you know, it's passed in the multi-class data set. It, it, it hides up most of the hard work for you. Um, but you can use, um, um, there are things, uh, so this might be important sometimes. Um, it's, it's more of a special kind of case, but uh, but uh, if you have a, a really important multi-class classification, it might be useful to compare whether the one versus uh, all versus the one versus one-on-one -on -one, uh, maybe gives you slightly different performance for your um, model that you're trying to build. Right? It can have some effects. Uh, not always, but some, some types of problems. You know, one will be clearly superior than the other. We're doing a multi-class project. So you can actually do that by hand uh, in scikit-learn. Um, so yeah, if you do the one versus one, uh, oh, I, I, yeah, I was wrong on my estimate. Um, it's, it's more like a, a 10 squared, but divided by two, because if I compare zero to one, I don't have to build another estimator to compare one to zeros. The same one can be used for uh, whether uh, which way we think it was the first one and the second one in the class. So you end up with a little under 50. Um, um, so 
So let me see here. One final thing, the, the uh, uh, we will run into this concept a lot then. So uh, often what you'll see on these models is that um, there is some further step that turns it into a good probability distribution. So the first thing I showed you uh, where there was 10 results, it was just like a raw number of where probably the bigger the number, the more, you know, the higher it thought it was that. So the fast and the smaller the, the negative, more negative the number was, the less likely it got it. So um, some of the fitness functions that we'll talk about, um, or you know, some models naturally will actually turn you into a proper uh, probability distribution. So by that I mean that um, the, the sum of our estimates sums up to one. So if you added those up here. So uh, not all classifiers support the predict probab method, uh, but uh, the ones that can calculate that easily uh, with good performance uh, will give you this method here, which gives you the probability distribution. So th this is the easiest to understand usually for people that start digging into the details of how you know, the classifier, multi-class classifier works. Um, uh, so since that's the sum of the one, you know, it's, it's basically, the same as saying you know, ninety percent probable that uh, five or whatever that class is, or one, two, or three, or five, I think. Um, where so you can answer questions like you know what's the second most probable? Uh, so we got uh, probably a five, but it's, if I'm wrong, maybe a three. It's a little bit higher than the others. The second place. Um. So yeah, that was stuff. So um, uh, yeah, I mean, you know, at the end we can ask. Um, I guess there's a little bit of discussion about uh, how's how's this do for uh, the full MNIST data for the full multi-class. So notice that the you know the performance goes down to about eighty percent here. Um, and uh, again, we're using cross validation like we talked about. So this is. Um, uh, probably a, an okay estimate of how this model would actually do data it wasn't trained with, um, uh, but we're only getting about 80%. Um, but, uh, you know, here, um, the um, baseline you know, uh, is much different. So this might be much more impressive than what we had before because uh, you can't really do a simple baseline like we did before that will get you to 90%. So kind of probably the, the best baseline you can do here is random guessing, uh, which was what I was thinking about before, probably. But random guessing will only probably get you, will, will only get you an accuracy of 10%. I have to guess one to 10 uh, what the true uh, label is. 10% of the time I'll be right if I just random. Manually guess. Um, so, you know, getting a score of 87%, 86% um, is um, probably you know, pretty good, as Dave said, using this class model. Um, the, although the state of the art, I'm sure we talk about here, but the, the this is where neural networks and deep neural networks um, currently, the convolutional networks for doing image analysis. So this is a type of image analysis problem here to kind of categorize the digits. Right? So, so uh, the best models get 99.9 some percent accuracy on the full MNIST data set. So that's where people are right now with this classification problem. Um, so oh yeah, then a final word. Yeah. So of course evaluating uh, the how well it's performing on a multi-class task. Uh, you have the same problem with binary classification 
the graph. So accuracy might not be a, as e that easy of a measure to um, um, to interpret, depending on baseline performance and maybe other things. So um, so a good starting point is always confusion matrix. Uh, same idea, but um, it's going to be uh, same one predictions for columns and uh, the true labels for row. Uh, and the diagonal is going to be uh, the things I got correct, and the off diagonals are going to represent uh, false positives and false negatives that happened. Um, uh, one kind of problem, though, is that uh, you know once you start getting more than uh, uh, half a dozen, or, you know, six or seven um, classes. I can be hard to look at a, a table six by six or eight by eight row of numbers and uh, see everything. So visualizing uh, can be helpful um, in a large multi-class problem to see, you know, our raw count. Although, you know, it could be helpful. And I don't know if, if I want to compare my, my false negatives and false positives, um, those can be drowned out if I'm just plotting the, the raw uh, numbers that I had on each one of these cells as a color um, on a, a color bar here, right? So, you know, might want to zero those out uh, so that we can actually see potentially where we're getting um, um, problems in our multi-class classifier here. And so um, I don't remember if this is the exact same result the textbook had, but yeah, something seems to be going on here for, um, uh, for predicting lost states for some reason. Um, um, those are getting higher errors, so, uh, but this might be a first step. If you look at that, you might want to ask a you know, question of why are we doing so bad with that class compared to seems like others. Although there might be another band there of twos, maybe. Um, but uh, yeah, I don't know if the, the book it might not look exactly the same as the book. Uh, it might, de might depend on some of the uh, the way this stuff is run here. Um, oh, yeah. Uh, the I guess, you know, just, just to clarify this, uh, some people will use the term multi-label sometime. Um, so I don't know if you'll run across that. Um, it's more usual, more usual to have what we've been talking about here, the, you know, build one classifier, but the output is going to be a class that has more than two, more than binary. Uh, okay. So multi-label is just, uh, you know, Fancy name for meaning that um, I'm, I'm going to be outputting classes, but uh, I'm outputting more than one output. Right? So everything we talked about before, there's really only one output, our prediction of which class it is. But here we've got maybe two outputs or three outputs. Um, so um, Um, oh, so, you know, right. So if both of our outputs were binary, so the, the, the example from the textbook is we build a classifier that classifies odd digits and at the same time classifies it greater than, um, greater than or equal to seven, I guess, right? So um, we could build two separate classifiers or uh, you can build a single classifier where the outputs are pairs of binary. Classes and and like it were or having a multi label like that. So um, again, behind the scenes, it might actually build be building individual classifiers for uh, every one of the outputs that you want, or it might uh, depends on on the you know the algorithm, the type of the classifier, uh, or it might just be using one, uh, but it can set it up so that it reuses the work. To give multiple outputs or multiple labels. Um, yeah. 
And um, yeah, I don't know if you know, this is so important, but uh, of course you can have the, the the full combination. So I could have multiple outputs and the out some or all the outputs are non-binary. So um, I don't know if it's common to call that multiple output. I was probably confusing those there. So multi-label uh, though, uh, I usually think of that as multiple multi-output, um, but uh, our textbook's using that for multiple outputs for every output. And so the most general case then would be what it called multi-output for multiple outputs and each output can be um, a non-binary category. But but again, you know, scikit so learn uh, can do that as well. Or those things. Usually you don't have to do anything, it'll do the right thing behind the scenes if you give it the data of that type. Yes, there's no class model form. Um, all right. So that that was everything I wanted to say. I think we covered on on the classification. Um, so let's um, we'll talk in more detail about the assignments um, as it gets closer next week. But uh, I wanted to get started on it. So I'll remind you one thing: uh, there is a resource. It's a little bit hard to find to do some reorganizing here, but. Um, um, under the uh, archive subdirectory, there is it needs to be moved out of this because this one is the most directly uh, um, uh, relevant to our assignment two, the one with um, um, the one about using scikit learn and stats model. So I thought I'd go through that today, or at least get started on it. Um, Mainly because um, um, it does ask you to do a few things, even on this assignment, uh, that may not make uh, complete sense yet uh, until we talk a little bit more about the details of how uh, regression uh, is actually solved and how uh, classification using the logistic function uh, is solved. Um, but yeah, to do the stuff that you're asked for in the assignment, um, there's a couple of things I did want to, to mention. Most of that stuff is covered in this lecture notebooks, and there's a, a video that I'll be covering some of the same stuff here. Um, so some of this is is you know about the API and things. I don't don't want to talk about that. I want to move to. Um, 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 talking about linear regression with this. Um, so here we've got uh, data frame uh, similar to what we did for time two. Uh, we've got some features and um, um, this is housing price again, although this isn't the same California data set that we were using in chapter two. Uh, uh, in this case, if I remember right, it's just individual uh, house prices with different features about it. Um, so a little bit hard to see here, but that's scientific notation, but that's the, I guess, the sales, sales price for the house uh, in dollars, um, uh, which, you know, uh, the idea is we might build a regression problem to try and predict the house price again, so like we did in chapter two regression. So that's uh, you know, five times 10 to three, 5,000. Sounds like a really cheap house, but there they are. Um, might, be, might be some data of, of empty lots or something like that in here. Uh, oh, I'm sorry, uh, yeah, I'm confusing that. So, um, uh, yeah, so yeah, this is the describe here. So this is showing the uh, the min, max, and median of, of all the numeric attributes. Forgot about that. You, um, uh, you know, I think I asked you to do that once or twice, assignment two, just to uh, do a little uh, kind of data exploration. So uh, one, one of the most basic things you can ask is get an idea of the range of the numeric attributes. Um, so yeah, the price is actually what, uh, Varying from fifteen thousand dollars to um, 
2.4 million. Um, so some of this other stuff in here uh, might be useful to you to figure out how to answer some of the questions on assignment two. Um, like figure out the correlation between specific things. But um, on the assignment two, um, um, we ask you to visualize, uh, uh, we, we just pick two attributes. So we're going to do a regression problem where we use the temperature at 9 a.m. for the independent variable and we're trying to use that to predict what the um, uh, evaporation rate. Okay. Um, and then I, we ask you to use scikit-learn to do a linear regression on that to display your results. Right? So uh, in this one, if you pulled out everything, I mean, this is what you should get kind of if you, you know, if you perform the regression correctly um, and you visualize the way it's asked for uh, and you add the regression line on there to your data. Um, 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 uh, the plot of temperature versus evaporation uh, looks like this scatter plot here, and there's a positive trend or positive correlation. So, which should make sense. Evaporation is how fast water is falling in rain. Let's dry back up, right? So, the, uh, the, the, the higher the temperature, the faster it evaporates. Let's say it would make sense that there's a, a relationship, a positive relationship. The bigger one gets, the bigger the other. Um, so yeah, the, the assignment two, we ask you to do that uh, and, and do it to create a linear regression model and plot the resulting linear regression uh, using scikit-learn and then also to create a linear regression model using the stats model. Okay. Um, so uh, since we're not gonna, well, we will start talking about linear regression next week. Um, so this is a preview of some of that. Um, but um, so let's say for this data set that we want to uh, predict the price uh, using just one feature, I guess what we did in this. So um, uh, like maybe the area income or something like that. So we should build a regression model just of those two data points. So uh, here, you know, this is useful. This is the, the pair plot from Seaborn. So this shows every relationship between each um, attribute and the other, right? So this can be uh, similar to using correlation. So the more this looks like a line, either positive or negative, the more highly correlated those two features are. So this might be a little small to see, but um, uh, average area income, correlated to price, right? which makes sense. Uh, most of the rest of these don't look uh, quite as nicely correlated. Um, um, maybe house age might have a little bit. Most of the, when, when it's a blob, it's pretty round. Um, the correlation is probably pretty small. Um, yeah, and I guess, and, and also if it's not, um, clear, but you know, see this in case this is probably categorical data. So all these things are in different categories or bands for the um, uh, number of bedrooms, so like one, two, three, four, five or something. Um, so um, there is an example. Um, so you, I'm, I'm basically most of the you know, first part of the first question is you need to do something similar uh, as what's shown there at the end of the regression. Um, so you've already seen examples of that. So if we want to just build a, a simple linear regression, we can import the model, um, create an instance of it, and uh, fit it to our data. Uh, so here uh, in this notebook, we should, uh, oh, does it, we're actually um, fitting all the data. So in your assignment, you only fit one feature here we're going to fit every feature that we have uh, as input. So you can't really visualize that um, um, uh, the resulting regression here. Uh, but you know, you can fit a model with, with uh, multiple um, inputs, um, but to have our regression output. Um, so some of the things you're asked to do is display the, the coefficients and the intercepts. Right? Um, 
So that's one thing, you know, this um, might be getting into some of the stuff that we're going to do next week, but I, I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, actually, maybe it would be better if I just brought up. That notebook here. Um, yeah, let's use this as another housing prices, uh, one quite the same one that I was talking about before. Uh, but um, um, let's say that you want to create a regression of um, the, uh, the the size of the house to try to predict its value or sale price. That, that's what we're doing here. So we have a similar data set, not exactly the same. Um, but here we we basically created two arrays. So uh, if you know, we, we read in the pandas data frame. Um, uh, we do a little bit of data cleaning, uh, but then we pull off uh, the price and the y. So if you ask for values, that actually returns a numpy array. So after we do this, y is a numpy array that has the, the house price values. Um, and likewise, um, x is going to end up being a numpy array. So they'll both have the same number of uh, rows, uh, but just one uh, column. So if we look at the shape of these, um, Good to know, you know what these are. So if we look at um, the shape, uh, they all end up being vectors in this case. And I wasn't completely certain myself. So, uh, but but yeah, we're getting off um, something that's a NumPy array um, in both cases, but it's one dimensional. Um, this might make a difference because sometimes you might have to pass in something that's actually two dimensional, even though you've only got one feature. So some of the um, um, some of the things you're asked to do on task for the next assignment might require you to um, reshape. Um, and you can use negative one to say, figure out what the correct number is for the shape function. So this will give me one column with however many rows are needed. Um, that I just uh, mentioned that, remember that uh, you might have to go back and forth between those depending on what you're doing. Um, psychic more than once. We might even need to do that in this um, uh, example here. But um, so yeah, I mean, you are asked to do a scatter plot. A plot. Um, same as this, actually two plots you're asked to do for the linear regression. Um, some, some notes about that. Um, make certain that you need to do a scatter plot. So whenever you're showing raw data, uh, you should use points, not line segments connecting things up. In this case, if you plot lines, uh, you'll see kind of a mess. So it's quite easy to know that you're uh, not doing the scatter plot. Um, Make certain that you label your axes and things like that. Um, but um, I wanted to talk about the, uh, the one of the next things you have to do uh, after you create a, a regression model is to um, plot the line, right, and to do it by hand. Okay, so um, I mostly want to talk about that. Uh, so there's a lot of that stuff here. I mean, I'm getting started, I guess, um, on next week's stuff here a little bit early. Um, but um, 
Um, remember, remember back to again a basic uh, this is geometry or three algebra or something. Um, so the idea of graphing things and and determining the equation of a line to fit points, stuff like that. Um, so for example, if we just pick two points uh, on our data here, which is all we're doing here. So we just take the first two points. They just happen to be these two points. Uh, but if you remember back, we can create uh, a line that actually goes through those two points. Right? So two points define the line in two dimensions. Um, remember back to your basic slope intercept form. Um, uh, if we plug in, you know, so if we solve for, so we need to know the slope. Uh, well, we need to know the two values, the slope and the intercept. To, to specify this line here. So we can solve for M. Um, so the slope is really, you know, how much we change uh, on X causes a change on Y if it's a line, right? So the slope is really the ratio of actually the change of Y to the change of X. So I can tell you the slope, you know, since it goes from, uh, we change 70 units uh, on Y divided by um, approximately 500, 7 or 5, a little bit bigger than one for a slope here. Oops, I have that backwards. So um, 400 to uh, uh, sorry, 70, 70, uh, 70 to 500, so seven fifths. Hopefully, hopefully somewhere closer to what I was expecting there. But then given the slope, um, I could pick one of these points um, and I'll get a line with that slope that goes through there. Uh, and that line will go through either point, so I could pick either point. Um, so if I pick the first point, uh, let's give us our slope, right? So what I'm getting at is um, uh, if we have that, I could plot that. So, so that would be the line that goes through those particular two points, all right? Um, so for assignment two, I can come back. Um, so, so at this point, we get into starting to talk about some of the details of um, how we calculate the regression. Um, so, Um, I wanted to see get further out. Um, run all these, I guess. So we're going off to the all these details here. Um, I guess I didn't see what I was looking for. Um, but um, Yeah, I guess we didn't. I didn't have an example of um, using um, scikit learn to fit a regression in there. So uh, what I wanted to show was um, let's go back to this one here. So uh, if we fit a model um, to our data, um, like we're doing here again, some way you have to do a similar thing for example two. Um, Um, after you fit a model, if it only has two parameters, it's logistic regression. Um, so you can get the, um, uh, the the coefficients and the intercept. Um, so to cut the chase, what those end up being, if I only have a single parameters, I'm going to have a single coefficient, um, and and they'll, they'll always be just a single value for the intercept. So like for this data where we use all five 
features, uh, we had five coefficients, uh, but uh, the intercept was um, um, uh, just the single value there. So this big number is actually the intercept. Okay. So you know these correspond to uh, the slope uh, and the intercept for the line we were just talking about, right? So so given uh, if I have a single feature, I only have a single coefficient. So given those two numbers, uh, this value in the coefficient um, um, corresponds to the slope, or often called m, right? So. Uh, Hopefully this will run here, but if I have my model, let's rerun all those. So if we have our model, um, we can ask for the coefficient, uh, it'll actually return back um, all the coefficients. Um, so for this one, we might have multiple of them. Um, so, you know, we've got one for each of the features that we were building a regression model of. Uh, but um, um, if one, I mean, that's just a regular NumPy array, right? So um, if you only have one, you'll still get an array, but you have to pull out the particular value. So um, we can get our slope for any particular parameter. So for this one particular parameter, we can pull that out like that. Same, the, the intercept uh, will be, um, Um, well, so um, I guess it'll be a single value, so you don't have to actually pull it out. So you can, um, you know, it's it's, a, it's a, a scalar instead of a, a an array. Right? So anyway, you have the slope there. But given those two things, um, just so everybody knows how to do this part of the assignment is once you fit your regression model, and there's various ways you can show what the model is. But you know, you can do it by hand, which is what I asked you to do in this assignment. So you have to pull out the slope and the intercept. Calculate a line um, that um, that slope and intercept defines, and then display that line on the same plot as your scatter plot. That's where this is coming from. Uh, and more hints on that. I mean, you know, given I just showed you how you can get the slope uh, and the intercept term. So given that, um, um, all you need is like two points. Um, so I could take. Um, 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 the point at uh, zero, where my uh, value is, um, and um, I also use one point, right? So you can calculate that for where x is zero to figure out um, the equation of your life. Uh, um, sorry. Uh, what I mean, like all, all you need to draw the line, uh, all you need is two points where you have both the, uh, you know, the x and the y location. So if you have the slope and the intercept, um, I can calculate the value of my function uh, at x is zero and also calculate it at like x is 25. Once I have those, I've got enough information to plot the line that goes between those two points. Um, so that's that's all you need to do for this one here. We've had a couple of examples of plotting some lines these specific. Um, okay, and uh, one final thing. Um, yeah, so um, um, there are some other stuff. Uh, let's real quick, look at the uh, uh, linear regression uh, using the STAS model. Um, uh, we'll probably have have to talk more about this as well, but you can also do uh, linear regression with stats model. So a couple of things on that that you need to know out. Uh, these are mostly covered in this. Um, 
for reasons that will become clearer, um, stats model, you often have to do this before you create a linear regression model. Uh, this is adding a constant dummy feature uh, for the um, intercept parameter. And that will make more sense when we talk about the details of how you, uh, how you, uh, you know, calculate a linear regression for study data. So anyway, so one difference on SAS model, if we want to use it, this is the kind of standard way that we import the SAS model. Um, so if we want to do the same regression that we did before on all five features, um, uh, we can just keep X that has all five columns, but we would have to add in this dummy constant before you do your uh, regression model using uh, the stats model library. Um, and if you remember, if for scikit-learn, uh, you create an instance of an object and then you call fit with the, the input and the labels that you want to fit it to. So the API is a little bit different for stats model. So for stats model, um, um, when you create an instance of the object, which is the OLS here, you pass in the data. Another thing that often causes an error is those are actually flipped for some reason. So it puts the labels as the first parameter. Um, and the inputs of the second parameter. Uh, but then you do have to call a fit function for stats model. But at that point, then you've got uh, a linear regression. In this case, the OLS, uh, we, we talk about here, um, this stands for ordinary least squares. So this is really using the root mean squared uh, error that we talked about last time. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's just kind of another name, OLS. Or in the squares, but that's the one that's doing a basic linear regression in the stats model library. Um, so one of the things that's asked about is, uh, so let me just make a, a few things about the summary here. Um, I was going to talk about R squared, uh, I'll have to do it some other time, um, but you, you're asked to compare like the R squared uh, result um, and the um, um, result of the model itself. So the way you do that, like for example, the, the model here in stats model, when we ask for the summary, these values are, that's the intercept term called constant in this output. Uh, and those are the slope term for the five features of our fitted ordinary least squares linear regression. So uh, since these should be performing exactly the same linear regression, you should get exactly the same values from staff model for the fitted regression as you get for the, the intercept and the coefficient term uh, from cycle should be exactly uh, the same here. Likewise, you should get the same R squared score when you calculate that. We'll talk about some other time. Um, And um, there's other, the reason why I wanted to show another example of how to create a basic linear regression using this, this other library, stats model. Uh, so stats model is used by more by working stat statisticians rather than machine learning engineers or data scientists. Um, so one thing is that, you know, for example, we get a lot of statistical analysis of the regression. So this, this stuff over here is very useful. If you ever need to use a linear regression for uh, something, this is basically given confidence intervals for each of the estimates of the parameters. So we're, we're this is a ninety-five percent confidence interval. So we're ninety-five percent confident that the true value of the intercept is between those two values. What that column is saying actually. The other this this is actually the p-value, which is a measure of significance. Um, so anything that's low. Um, the, the model statistically was confident that it was a good estimate. So we had mostly everything for good estimates of the slope for each of those parameters, except for maybe one. But that might indicate something, uh, you know, we might want to drop that that uh, from our model. It's not performing well, or other things we might want to do about that. All right. Uh, yeah, so that's a good place to stop. I'll stop there. Um, We'll see you guys next week on Tuesday. I have office hours as usual. If anybody has any questions about stuff, but we'll get more into linear regression um, next week.